a lot of literature and a lot of uh, practitioner um, uh, insights have over, already critiqued women empowerment. Uh, Abu Lugha, for example, talks a lot about how donor-funded programs um, use like very reductive discourses when addressing Arab women. Uh, Jamal has written how women political empowerment program often targets a particular class of women, whether NGOs or like women in an urban setting. And Tadros has written a lot about how such programs really um, become disempowering because they isolate women's experiences from the broader uh, collective experience and look at like more individual level empowerment. Islamic politics. Existing experiences and literature says to women that they need to put themselves forward and become candidates, but in Lebanon, candidate decisions are strictly in the hands of the male Zaim. The Zaim is the spokesperson, deal broker, and decision maker on behalf of an entire community. The Zama, mostly formal warlords, have created a lot of parapublic mechanisms to resolve tensions, so informal institutions like dialogue tables. And they practice mutual tolerance and take these decisions in between themselves, making it very difficult for women to access these places. The Zaims, they, uh, the, they check the pulses of their constituencies before forming their lists. And a lot of them face resistance from their constituencies when I, they approach them with women candidates. The reason for that is because usually um, blocks of votes come in uh, big families and in, uh, you know, big uh, tribes in certain areas in the Bekaa or others. And these people feel like, like, we don't have a man in the family. You have to choose a woman from this, you know, area or from constituency. The third institution is looking at uh, the nature of the court system, particularly religious courts. Women are legally weaker citizens and have less rights compared to men. And I'll not go into nationality law, access to national social security fund, um, the right to do trade. And also as a reminder, until very recently, Lebanese rapists had the option of marrying their victim. Lebanese law still punishes women for a number of issues and, and, and discriminates on a lot of personal status issues. Quote, I was trained to think that I need to come up with a policy project and present it to the head of the party and then he will notice me and see that I am competent. And this is frankly ridiculous. Uh, another quote, my father thinks it's great for me to attend these things, and she means like women in empowerment, but that the language and the definition do not really apply to campaigning in our So there's really a disconnect between the type of knowledge, um, a side note, for example, just looking at the type of referencing in these, in these documents, largely like Western, uh, references. So this idea that this knowledge is disconnected uh, according to the participants. The trainer thinks that this must be Sweden and that if we go to our party, we can lobby internally, build alliances for women candidates. And the truth is that candidates are selected by the Zaim. We learn great lobbying tools that have nothing to do with our parties. But if you take me to Sweden, I guarantee I make an excellent candidate. You guys like to meet after 10 or 11 p.m. They smoke and they talk a lot. I just stopped attending these meetings. It's more difficult for younger women to go out late and attend. Like This is how politics happens very informally, but it's harder for a young girl to be there. Another quote, the main leader of our party is always surrounded and cuddled by other men. I never get one-on-one -on -one time with him, even though I handle one of the major portfolios in this party. Um, another quote, decisions are taken in Tehran and in Riyadh. How will I ever be invited to those meetings? I never get invited, so I sit and wait to hear from colleagues who do get invited. Especially in the North African case, we like you know kind of really continuously see a lot more women effectively uh, elected to legislatures, usually between 50 to 20 percent. Now, there's a reason why there are more women in those particular legislatures. In fact, there's a reason why like North Africa pretty much leads the region uh, when it comes to this particular statistic. It's because they have gender quotas. Invariably, the countries that actually have gender quotas have more women in politics and have more women in parliaments. 
Now, what's fascinating about that, and I think that this is one of the reasons why gender quotas have really become so much more popular over the last few years, is because once the quota is implemented, it actually not just incentivizes women to participate politically, but it also incentivizes political parties to start thinking about them strategically as potential actors within their spheres as well. Institutional procedures have a logic of their own, right? And one of the fascinating things about them, and this is why I think everybody should be paying attention to the Lebanese case, is for all the fact that everybody's saying that the Lebanese elections might be a foregone conclusion, the fact that the country has decided to go in a proportional direction might actually result in some slight shifts. It'll certainly result in shifts in the campaign trail. It'll certainly result in some shifts in terms of like what happens with the list. You'll probably get the same people in politics, but you might get a few new ones unexpectedly. There's a lot of money involved, especially right now, when it comes to sexual harassment, when it comes to rape. We have the Spotlight Initiative, which is basically a you know, kind of collaboration between the European Union and the United Nations right now. So like, you know, if there's ever a time to push this issue, it's a time when there's money. Okay? And one of the reasons why these women have been able to, like, for all practical purposes, have any power via be the states, and I think it's not an accident that it happens in Tunisia and Morocco, is that these are countries that basically have, they're highly dependent on foreign aid, and they're highly dependent on conditional foreign aid that tends to veer toward like no welfare initiatives, right? A lot of those welfare initiatives are oriented around women. I, again, I'm not saying that this is necessarily like, you know, for instance, like, you know, when these kind of policies get accepted, I feel that they get accepted cynically more often than not, right? But the reason why there might actually be some bargaining power is because there's like, you know, kind of conditional money from the outside. There is a disturbing neocolonial angle to this, right? And I don't want to hide that, okay? But I think the one positive side of this is that you actually have, like, you know, in my experience, Arab women very shrewdly using that angle, right? Especially at the grassroots level. Not necessarily in the legislatures, but from the grassroots level, yes. And, you know, kind of the more you can actually get some of those women into politics, I think the more. like the Mudawana laws in Morocco, right? Super progressive on paper, but they have to be enforced. And people actually have to know about them. Um, so my colleague, Katia Rajan Elliott at Hawaiian University, does really, really fascinating research on this. And when she has found in her work anecdotally and goes through like, you know, a ton of interviews and like, you know, kind of Atlas Mountains and so forth, that you actually have women, I, I think there's always this discussion of how like, you know, kind of illiterate women aren't aware of what's going on. Like, you know what I mean? This is like this huge barrier. But Katia actually found in like, you know, going to the Centre de Coutes, like going all over, like, you know, Francis Morocco, and like, you know, kind of really surveying, like, you know, the Atlas region, um, that a lot of women actually do, regardless of educational level, actually do know that the Moldau women exist. They do actually know that they have, like, you know, some advantages in terms of these, like, legal costs. They just don't expect it to be enforced. The frustration, the anger at exclusion, the exhaustion of continuous trying, and the eventual dropping out apathy and, God forbid, learned helplessness is evident throughout all of Carmen's narratives, all of those women that she interviewed. I repeat the quote, I do not even want to be in politics anymore. It's really the job of a man in this country. I think what's admirable about campus here in AUB is that we're both looking internally to what's happening on campus and we're looking at our community outside of campus and within the region. I wanted to just list a few if I may. Starting internally and looking at ourselves, we have launched under uh, President Khoury, the Equity and Title IX Coordinator at the Office of the President, seriously considering harassment and other forms of gender-based violence and exclusion on campus. We have launched initially last year the task force, which has now proudly been turned into a standing committee on the lives and careers of women, looking to see how we can develop the processes and oversight structures to improve their careers on campus. We have launched through the work of Dr. Brigitte Khoury and Ms. Trudy Hodges, a climate survey specifically targeting the experiences of harassment on campus. We have launched the last one, the, La the Randa Bader Award in recognition of outstanding leadership in support of the careers of women. And that's what we're, you know, just a few small examples of things we're doing for ourselves, by ourselves.